My, my, we have a lot to cover today. Ruby Volume 4 is coming out October 22nd, and for months I've been promising to do a video reviewing Ruby Volume 3. I hope you guys saw the little coming soon trailer I posted earlier. There will be a link in the description below. And you get to see Team Ruby be quite cross with me over not getting this video sooner. Or getting on with it, I should say. I also added in a little segment uh, presenting my concept design for Yang's robotic arm. And just so you know, that arm incorporates some real-life technology currently undergoing testing at UTD, MIT, and a few other well-renowned colleges. I also made a remark on the strength of the carbon nanotube artificial muscles. When I said that they're 20 times stronger, I mean that the muscle fibers are 20 times stronger pound for pound than their equivalent in steel cable. So I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, now I've got a few things to mention before we actually get started reviewing Ruby Volume 3. First things first, this video will include vulgar language. Disclaimer for anyone reacting to this video, not much of a shock for anyone used to my channel. Second, this video goes out to a few friends of mine from the Ruby forums. First off, a guy by the name of Yitzul. He's freaking out a little right now since Yang's one of his favorite characters, and he's actually said he's on hiatus from Ruby Volume 4 until there's some concrete evidence that she's going to get a new arm. He's a really nice guy, and I've been promising you I'd uh, make this video and have subsequently failed to do it for far too long. So here it is. Next shout out goes to Marissa Kennedy, another forum member, as well as fellow YouTuber and artist. There's going to be a link to one of her videos talking about Pyrrhonicus' death, and technically it's about whether she should come back, but she really leaves that up to the viewer, so, you know, spoiler alert. <laughs> I feel like she really covered the topic quite well, hence why I'll leave as much as I can to her video to explain my views on the topic. It's a little over an hour long, but there's barely any filler, and there's a few good jokes in there too. Lastly, the Volume 4 character short trailer is out, and the link to the video will also be in the description down below. With that said, let's do this. Volume 3 was incredible, a tremendous leap forward in the show's array of awe-inspiring facets. The choreography, the voice acting, animation styles, and story were far more sophisticated now than ever, and are going to continue to become more sophisticated and more effective further on. But, along with that, there were a series of unfortunate circumstances that seemed to change everyone's perspectives overnight, and as much as people like to criticize the volume for those faults, the story wouldn't be where it is without them in the amount of time it took. We were shocked by the dark turn towards the ends of the volume, but that will, you know, that we will get to in a little bit. Okay. Choreography. Choreography has come a long way in Ruby, but in doing so, some of the original allure changed. He first fell in love with the burn and turn action, the incomprehensible blitzkrieg of strikes, coordinated directly in response to each enemy's approach. This was Monty's animation prowess at work, a high-paced, barely scripted organic fight scene. However, what we see towards the end of Ruby Volume 3, and especially in the Ruby Volume 4 trailer, is a more scripted style of choreography that places more emphasis on drama and tension than the shock and awe energy of the originals. Yes, the fight scenes are still amazing, and yes, they provide more emotion and pump a bit more life into the scenes, but it's hard to do without making the outcome seem like a power play. What do I mean? An organic fight, like the fight between Donnie Yen and Wu Jing in Killzone SPL, which was mostly improvised by the way, gives more of a feeling that anything can happen, and that either fighter can win. In the end of that fight, the choreography became more heavily scripted, and there were a few other moments within it. Uh, there should be some footage up on the screen by now. And you know, what resulted w was uh, establishing that Donnie would win because he was meant to win. It became a power play, a push for the story. Now, that's not always bad, but there were moments in Ruby w uh, when that became an issue, and the new push towards more scripted choreography in the series to make the process less time-consuming and more efficient it could continue to be an issue. This is just my personal preference. I prefer the organic fights, and even if they do have the occasional power play moment, I think those moments, they should change the game, add excitement to the fight, okay? Ruby is really more about who's got the better movesets, who's got the better skills, the better strength, and who can put their skills and strengths to better use and better guard their weaknesses. So, when did the fights go wrong in Ruby? I didn't exactly like uh, Blake and Yang versus Adam, especially since Yang didn't even shoot once. 
She was out of ammo, stop being so critical, cry all the fanboys. Wait, out of ammo? Really? Then why jump in the air and scream so much? <laughs> this isn't Dragon Ball Z, you don't scream to make shit happen, okay? This is Ruby. If you want to get shit done, you shoot something, okay? And if she was out of ammo, wouldn't she just charge at him? Maybe throw a table, punch him in the nuts after doing like a slide through between his legs, grab Blake and run? Rather than just jumping in the air and, <gasps> you know, that, that didn't make sense. Like, what the fuck? Next up was Cinder vs. Ozpin, and it went rather well in the beginning. Ozzy was holding his own, and both were using their skills rather than just raw power and, you know, lights and flashy explosions and shit. The ending, however, was a DBZ power play. It was all about Cinder being in the air with all the fireballs flying around and just boom, blowing shit up. Last is Cinder vs. Pyrrha, and I was hyped for that, yeah, as were most of us, uh, initially, because the way the story had been built up, it seemed like you know, maybe Pyrrha would actually have a shot. You know, It seemed like they were setting her up to be such a powerful character. She defeated Penny. She was, you know, so powerful. She took on this little girl robot with the power of an armored battalion, for crying out loud. Like, okay. <sighs> so it initially made us hyped because it seemed like it was moving towards that kind of matchup. And because of the hype, it initially made sense that maybe, just maybe, Pyrrha had a shot. There will be more on that later, and I know everyone's been talking about it. Oh, it's like the email scandal all over again. I'll let Marissa's video cover the more important details, as there's plenty for both sides of the argument on the issue, and she covers it to a T. Kudos for that. Next is character development. I forgot to mention we're doing the better parts of the story first and we'll cover the negatives later. Okay? Volume 3 gave us more of almost everything, which is understandable seeing as the chapters became around 20 minutes long in some cases. But it wasn't filler that made the chapters long, like in other series. And they were longer because there was so much more character development and plot. Ruby is growing up. Weiss lives in an oppressive household. Blake has a past to run from. Yang is protective of her friends, kind of like Shank from One Piece. <laughs> John's an oblivious fuck nugget. Pyrrha doesn't know when to use her sniper rifle. God damn it, middle of the tournament. They're getting shot at. What do we do? Use the fucking rifle. <sighs> Nora's an orphan. Ren's also an orphan. You see where I'm going with this? That was fun to see, and exciting since we got so much of it. A lot of us thought these developments would last. Sadly, that wasn't quite the case, but there will be more on that when I cover character developments and drawbacks later on. The visuals and audio. The visuals and audio were spectacular. The graphics were awesome. The character movements were smoother and cleaner, and it was overall great. The textures were cleaner, the effects were stepped up, and the voice acting was superb. In the beginning, Ruby and Pyrrha both had slightly deeper voices, and over time they began sounding more like kids. In fact, if you look at the last couple of chapters of Volume 3 and compare it to Jen's voice acting in Ruby Chibi, it sounds a bit different. Like, you can hear that the Volume 3 Pyrrha is a bit more nasally and a bit, a bit more higher pitched. But then you see the, you know, the Chibi, you know, Pyrrha, and she's a bit more sing-songy and, you know, a little bit deeper voice. But overall, you know, it's alright, kind of works out. So for Volume 3, there's really not a whole lot to say here other than it was superb. Soundtrack, vocals, special effects, visual effects, fantastic, and it's all going to be even better in Volume 4, if the trailer is anything to go by. For the plot, the plot really picked up. In fact, it went so fast that the show went from a teaching the future generation of worldly saviors theme to an apocalyptic setting in the span of one volume, albeit with some aspects long time in the making. Sure, we had plot, but Volume 3 gave us plot! Eh? Eh? Oh, you guys are no fun. <sighs> Anyways, the central conflict was that a few secretive villains infiltrated the Vital Festival to take advantage of the publicity it attracted and wreak havoc. There were twists and turns, some good and some bad. Suddenly, Pyrrha is thrust into position of becoming a nigh-unstoppable magic demigoddess, while potentially at the cost of herself. Weiss overcomes the barrier to her semblance, allowing her to summon more powerful defeated foes, like a nigh-unstoppable demigoddess, and Ruby becomes... 
uh, nigh unstoppable demigoddess because her eyes are silver. Eh. In the end, however, the world is apparently screwed. There's a freaky bitch named Salem on the loose. Team Ruby is disbanded and completely buttfucked. Cinder is a magic demigoddess, and Pyrrha, Roman, and Penny are dead slash broken. Now we get on to the bad stuff about Ruby Volume 3. There is a priority on tension. The title says it all. The result of a large chunk of development throughout the volume came down to tension. Pyrrha's development and the promise of her becoming a maiden was simply to add tension and make her death all the more impactful. Why? Again, go check out Marissa's video in the description below because there's very few things I have to say about Pyrrha's abrupt end that haven't been stated and elaborated on in Marissa's video. Long story short, it really just feels as though Pyrrha got railroaded or killed off in a way that simply didn't fit and that was utterly just completely meant to push the development of another character. And the way that was achieved was simply by building up tension and hype. There were other situations where things were made to be somewhat tense, like the numerous times each member of Team Ruby was in a life or death situation, but they always miraculously survived, albeit not entirely unscathed. Okay, now we get to discrepancies, especially in character behavior and the development. This is where many of the mistakes were made, especially regarding, yes, you know who, Pyrrha. Okay, why would she put John in a rocket and expect him to be able to call for help? He's not going to be in there like some hero in an action movie. No, he's going to be screaming like a little girl fumbling for a paper bag to, you know, hyperventilate or some shit. No. That, what? What? Okay. Why face Cinder alone? Why not at least try and get an angle on her from a distance with her sniper rifle? Oh yeah, she didn't know when to use her sniper rifle. <laughs> da -da -da. Then there's Adam. Why stab Blake and disarm Yang, then just stand there and let both of them escape? Especially when he was clearly ready to kill Yang until he popped Blake's clone. Okay, it didn't quite make sense, and neither did the idea of Ospin just being missing, especially since there was really no way to get down there. You know, unless Crow turned into a crow and flew down there and saw no incinerated remains. Going back to Pierre's death, why did Ruby just sit there and not do jack shit? Her friend's got an arrow through her chest, but she's still alive. What was all that talk about back in Volume 1? Wanting to become a huntress to save people. And you don't do jack shit when the shit really matters. Your friend's alive. You have the opportunity. And what, you just sit there picking your nose, staring at the fucking moon or some shit? Hello? Help me! Nigga! Oh, and then there's the remainder of Team Juniper's reaction or behavior towards the end of the volume. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Ruby and Yang are all choked up about Pierre's death, but then you see just Jean Noir and Render just like, eh, fuck it. Adventure time! Let's do this. What the fuck? What the fuck? Uh, okay, you know what, guys? I'm just gonna be completely honest with you. Pierre's death was extremely personal for me, and that's why I'm so pissed off about it. I'll avoid getting into too much detail about it, but she reminded me of a girl who I really liked, and I was hoping Arcos wouldn't meet the same end, which is why when it did, I just, you know, facepalmed and walked away, okay? That's enough of that. I just, I just fucking left. I was like, fuck this. I kept coming back to it like five times to get all the details.